you'll see a portion. Here in Detroit, because it's south of us, we'll see 99%, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. wow. If you drove south to Toledo, maybe even just to Monroe, you'd see the mm -hmm. whole thing. Wow. wow. So uh, it's an extraordinary. Now, what happens is, <clears throat> And I'm looking at the horoscope of America. This has progressed to 2100, but it's similar. Uh, I had one for 1994 uh, and one for 2000, and this is 2100, uh, which is similar to what was happening at the time America uh, was uh, founded in 1776. The rising sign is Gemini, which makes perfect sense. It's a second race soul. America has a second race soul, the soul of love wisdom, which it shares with England. We've talked about it before in some of our uh, lectures. Uh, and it has a sixth ray personality. It also has a sixth ray astral body, which makes it prone to socialism, which is one of the things that frightens the spiritual hierarchy of our planet. The last thing they want to see is America become a socialist government. Uh, anyway, so what you want to do, the way to, to evaluate this event, this cosmic event, is since it's the, the, the uh, event is in Aries, you want to see where Aries is in your horoscope. And this is my horoscope. And in my horoscope, it's in the seventh house. It's the cusp of the seventh house, and the seventh house is in partnerships, marriage, business arrangements, and it's going to be very significant for me in my horoscope to see how all of that materializes, and it may take 10 years or more. This isn't something that happens in one day. The residual effect can be for years. Baker told me in 1999 when we were in England, and there was this massive uh, eclipse that took place. He, it took place off of the northeast coast of America, and it transited over across the southern tip of England at Cornwall, and then down through France, Germany, uh, down through Bulgaria, the Balkans, uh, down and ended in the tip of, of uh, India. And he said that, that one of the things that would come out of that that was most significant was to that it would bring a spiritual awakening of the esoteric teachings would take place. And it's happening. I have friends who are teaching esoteric astrology <laughs> in Bulgaria, of all places. But there's a huge interest in Italy and all across Europe. Uh, some of the absolutely finest books, metaphysical books, that are being printed in the world right now is a company in the Netherlands and the printing is being done in Slovakia, uh, one of the cities there in Slovakia. Uh, that big book I have of Manly yeah. Halls that's on the table up there, that's the company that printed that book. And when you look at there, and there's several other smaller books on astrology and alchemy, the quality of the printing, the quality of the paper, and they do them for uh, ridiculously low prices. But they're printing all kinds of metaphysical books that are flooding into Europe. Uh, I, we had some friends in Italy who own 13 all-called bookstores in Rome. Wow in wow. Rome. And one of them was about a block and a half from uh, from the Vatican. <laughs> that I thought was significant. <laughs> so, so Baker said to me, he gave me a guy's a phone number. And this phone number, he said, just, just call the guy and tell him Douglas Baker said hello and wondered how he was doing. So it turns out the guy was uh, a member of the Rockefeller family. Oh, oh my. my. And I called him. And the butler answered the phone and said that this particular gentleman was not home. 
And I said, well, I just wanted to leave a message. And I left the message the baker told me to leave if he wasn't there. So uh, some time went by. It wasn't long, maybe a month. And Baker asked me, he said, did you ever call that number? And I said, yes, I did. He said, that's a good thing. He said, because you have to respond within 10 years of, the, of that solar eclipse event. And you will receive, and of course, the, the uh, uh, for me, uh, Leo is on the cusp of the 11th house, which is groups. And it's ruled by Jupiter, which is the most benign of all of the planets. And I have Jupiter down here in the second house, which is the house of money and personal wealth. Mm. And I've been fortunate in my second house financially. Uh, it wasn't always that way, but it certainly has been that way since 1999, I can tell you that. And uh, I was able to finance the printing of these books for Baker and the mass distribution, which is in my horoscope, is the mass distribution of esoteric books in the first house. It's part of my soul's purpose. And it helped Dr. Baker financially, which is one of the great joys of my life, was to aid him uh, because he was always struggling like most esoteric people struggling for money uh, it seems like the, the esoteric people never have any money and uh, they're always uh, begging and trying to get money any way they can for their uh, livelihood and for their projects those are wind chimes out there if they're just so you <laughs> yeah anyway so the uh the thing that's significant in about this solar event is that Aries is in the eleventh house, and the, the it's the house of groups, and we're wondering about these groups of ten million or more. Some people estimate over the last fifty years that there's probably fifty million illegal immigrants have assimilated into the country. Now, we're going to get pretty esoteric, you know, so fasten your seat belts. <laughs> we are part of the fifth root race. It's called the Aryan root race. And it extends from the people of India, Afghanistan, uh, the uh, uh, Teutonic tribes, the Celtic tribes, and the Anglo-Saxons. The Anglo-Saxons are what we call the fifth sub-race. You have to read the books. You don't read the books. You all know what I'm talking about. So the Anglo-Saxon subrace uh, is a dominant subrace on the planet at this time. It wasn't always that way, but it is at this time. And it's halfway through its life cycle. And when a root race and a subrace are halfway through their life cycles, they come under attack they begin to show early signs of decay, that there's a decay of the civilization. And that's what we're witnessing. And it's gonna be interesting to see what this, because of its entry point into America, coming from Mexico into Texas, up through these uh, states here, even touching, actually touching, Southeastern Michigan, Cleveland, Toledo, Cleveland, on up into Maine, and then out into the Atlantic Ocean. Something big is going to happen. I don't know if they'll start shipping people back. I don't know uh, if somehow they'll assimilate into the country, into the civilization. 
But it's interesting that it goes up into Canada too, which is also a point of entry for illegal immigration. We have to consider it because it's in Aries and it's the 11th house and it's always the house of groups. And my group involvement here in Leo with Saturn, I have karma within the English ashram. I had karma with Douglas Baker, a very highly evolved spiritual teacher and most prolific author of esoteric books in the 20th century. These are just a few of the titles in these books that you see in this room. And all these, there's over a hundred titles. Uh, he wrote before he died the last several years of his life, 40,000 uh, essays and vignettes on quantum physics, a Herculean task. Uh, there's nobody even come close to that. So what, what you do, if you have your horoscope, is you look in your horoscope and see where, where Aries is in your horoscope. And that will tell you something about the effect that this, this solar eclipse is going to have on your horoscope, how it will affect you. I think I already know known will be a continuation a probably a business sort of a thing that I'll be involved in it's it's in the early stages of manifesting for uh, esoteric publications uh, with some of the uh, uh, friends of mine from uh, England that were Baker students and the uh, so Tracy's also is involved in that. So you'll have to look. Right at the Midheaven. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So so uh, Hiermanis uh, in the uh, 10th house and uh, ninth house, higher education. So we're working along similar veins because we're trying to promote the esoteric through the publication of new books. There's... Uh, Joe said at one time he had four terabytes of Baker's writings. I said, how many books would four terabytes be? These are new books. We well, said it'd be about a thousand. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> a thousand new books, which are in print. You know, take a lot of money. So I'm trying to, uh, at some point, my money will go to the Claregate Trust and uh, we'll get new books printed. Uh, we just printed here a while back, volume three of Esoteric Anatomy. Uh, I don't have any copies here, but I, I certainly I have volumes one and volume two. But uh, that's the important thing about it is because it's an Aries event, you want to see where Aries is in your horoscope. And that will tell you something about what you can expect maybe over the next several years. Uh, the, the, uh, the eclipses are always in different signs. And uh, we just had Pisces a while back. And now it's Aries. So we're, we're moving, we're moving in, uh, um, this direct we're moving from Pisces into Aries. This is the natural home for Aries. I have Libra on the rising sign, but if you saw a regular natal chart of a horoscope, Aries would be here, Pisces would be here, <coughs> the cusp of the 12th house. Very significant event and should not be taken lightly. And uh, so we're going to have a meeting here. I forget what the date was. The I think the eighth is on like a Monday, so a Friday would be uh, it's around the fifth or sixth, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Is that so? We'll have our next meeting will be I think on the the fifth or sixth of April, whatever. March or April? Um, April. I mean March, uh, April. 
it's an April event. Okay. So uh, got a couple of interesting April things. April eighth is the uh, is the eclipse. So um, anyway, yeah, I wanted to. Uh, here, here's one of the things that you need to know about the eclipse. What's happening is when the eclipse is covering the sun. The energy of the sun is building pressure. All of its energies, spiritual and other energies, are being compressed. And all of a sudden then, the moon passes and that energy is released to the earth. So you get a huge jolt of energy. <clears throat> and it's like a heartbeat of the solar system. In a way, it's a pulsing. Every time an eclipse takes place, it's a pulsing and it's affecting regions of the world. We are fortunate in the Northern Hemisphere to have this event and have it so close to us. Uh, we're, we're just slightly out of the path of totality, as I said earlier, which is a band about 70 miles wide. But it'll be significant to see what kind of things happening be, uh, will happen because of a migration of people who are traveling from here to New York. So where's New York? Right, right here. So they're on this arc, this, this passageway, many of them are heading in this direction. Uh, Chicago, Cleveland, uh, I don't know how many migrants are in Detroit, but there's probably quite a few. We just got to Mexican family moved in right behind me. Uh, anyway, so that's okay, but uh, I'm just saying there's this is a very significant thing. I don't know how it's going to manifest itself. Um, I'm hoping it's a, a very positive kind of an event. And the thing that's significant is that the spiritual hierarchy of the planet is meeting in 2025 may at the time of the waysack festival they will meet and they are going to try to determine and establish the direction of uh, their energies in bringing about <laughs> and activating the Aquarian age. Interestingly, the hierarchies plans, sometimes they don't work out. A, a, a good example of the hierarchies plans not working out was the League of Nations. And now we're seeing that the United Nations is faltering, has become, become corrupted. And so once again, and then you get all these people that followed Ben Krim. Anybody know who Ben Krim was? I met him a couple times in my life. He was a, an Alice Bailey student, elderly Englishman, snow white hair, traveled around the world talking about the return of the Christ. And... Uh, he was a big advocate for the, he was an advocate for the United Nations and that he wanted to let everybody know that the Lucis Trust, who publishes the Alice Bailey books, uh, was at a center within the UN and how important that was. Uh, I don't know if it means anything or not. What I see out of the UN is a totally corrupt organization. Right. It needs to be purged or rebuilt. Um, those kind of things can happen in a very short period of time, but but we're uh, we're just a little more than a year away from the 2025 event of WASAC and the convocation of the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. And Baker told me, uh, in confidence, just the two of us, that if certain things weren't rectified, weren't cleaned up, weren't improved upon, that the 2025 event wouldn't take place. 
that the plan of the hierarchy is to use America, America as the focal point for the spiritual event. Uh, and uh, it may be moved to Europe. And in a lot of ways, I, I see that happening already. Um, people who are involved in alternative medicine know that when you go to Europe, it's everywhere. And over here, it's still uh, uh, taboo to a certain extent. People are opening up to it by vast numbers, but uh, it's not where it is in Europe, where it's very common, very popular. So some things to think about. Um, like I said, it, it will, it, this, this uh, energy of Aries, <clears throat> which is significant in the eclipse, is uh, the Greeks used to pick guys that were born under the sign of Aries, and they would be the front guard. In Vietnam, you'd be the point man. And uh, a good point man in Vietnam was a guy who was born in Aries. <clears throat> They'd plow right through, you know, the jungle and the dense uh, undergrowth. And uh, it's the the marching sound of a of a group of soldiers, left, right, left, right. And that's what Aries does. It forges ahead. So some of the energies that are coming for this this solar eclipse will be very direct, very powerful, very regimented. And it may be, it may be that uh, if Donald Trump wins the election, there'll be a lot of people uh, going back home or at least to a different location or they'll have to set up some sort of a system to which they're, which they're not doing uh, to screen people. There's no screening. You don't know who's coming in. They had a bunch of Syrian guys with combat uniforms on yesterday was on the internet coming across the border. Yeah. I mean, doesn't sound good. No. So we have to be mindful of it. And uh, uh, it says here that the eclipse will be visible throughout all 48 uh, uh, of the states. Monday, April 8th, total solar eclipse uh, in North America. So uh, we'll see what happens. Now, are there any questions before we move on to our next vignette? How long is the age of Aquarius? How, how many years is that? It's about 2,200 years. That's, okay, 2,200. Yeah. And, then and then after that? Capricorn. Capricorn. <laughs> yeah, well, what happens is during the age, it's a, an age of tremendous opportunity, the age of Aquarius. Blavatsky said that the age of Aquarius began in the year 1900. Rudolf Steiner said that the age of Aquarius began in 1899. So that's good enough for me. If you think about all of the events that have taken place in the last 100 years in the in birthing in the birthing of aquarius from 1900 to now 2024 uh, it signals the death nail of the of the piscean age pisces was an age of disappointment an age of turmoil ba baker said to blavatsky he had contact with her on the inner planes he said, give me a sign. Give me a sign of, of Pisces. And he said, Blavatsky went like this and rang her hands, wrenching her hands. And it's like the two fishes of Pisces swirling in the water. And uh, it was a perfect symbol uh, of the age of Pisces, uh, where our greatest hopes and wishes were never realized. They will be realized in the age of Aquarius. Hey, David. So, yeah. What was the age before the um, age of Pisces? Was that Aries? Yeah. yeah. And what was before Aries? 
was uh, Taurus. Taurus, yeah, Taurus, the yeah. bull. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's why you see the bull is so prominent in uh, 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 Minoan civilizations. Uh, in the uh, Aries, the ram in Judaism. In uh, Judaism, yeah. yeah. Uh, and what, what what was it around the time of um, Adam? Was that uh, Taurus? I, I, don't, I don't know. When was Adam? See, that's the question. I don't know when Adam was. Because if you study the writings, if you study the writings, the, which, is, which is a good segue for our next vignette, we're going to talk about now. We're, we're done talking about astrology. Uh, and, and Galen has given us an opportunity to move in to our topic, which just sprang out of nowhere uh, on Wednesday. And it's about Cyclops, oh. the Cyclops, yeah. people and animals with one eye. And we have pictures of these things. And we need to, uh, we need to discuss some of these events. Here's two, just while we're, we're getting organized. The significance of a solar eclipse is that it activates what's in your horoscope. Look where Aries is in your horoscope. It activates what's in the chart. And by this, we mean the zodiacal sign that is prominent at the time of the eclipse. Also, the degree of the eclipse and the degree of the sign in your horoscope so how many degrees aries do you have in your horoscope and find that out and you'll see if you're lightly impacted or heavily impacted the bigger the number the bigger the degree the more you'll be impacted by it yeah yeah um so i don't know that much you know about the charts in mm -hmm. astrology so do we all have something in aries yeah you know of course. every person does yeah you have aries in so some house some even house. if the house is blank it's still it's in that house and it has the energies of that house uh, uh in aries mm -hmm. uh, and so you need to consider yeah. it from that perspective okay. okay so anyway let me get rid of this the time being i'll take that yeah, thanks. Thanks, Liz. Uh, we'll have more on this at our lecture in uh, on uh, uh, in April, uh, whatever it is, the fifth or sixth of, of April. So I have a lot more information for you by then, and uh, I'm going to put these pictures up. This is some incredible stuff. I had this one. I think I showed this one to you a long time ago. It was a kitten that was born with one eye. It didn't live long, but it's a, a cyclopean, a cyclopean kitten. I came across this in the internet the other day. It's a man yeah. in Indonesia who's born with one eye. Really? In a baby born with a tail. Quite common, actually. They say that the tail forms and then eventually falls off or disintegrates in about eight weeks during the in, in, in pregnancy. So, Blavatsky says in the secret, Blavatsky says in the secret doctrine that the massive stone structures of the world were built by a race of one-eyed giants. We're talking about men and women of enormous size and enormous strength. Baker said that they worked in squads. So you'd have four or five or six working together. They say that a gorilla is, has the strength of 20 men, a gorilla. 
When I was a little boy, I had a friend uh, whose grandfather lived in Columbus, Ohio. And he had us down for uh, a few days and took us to the Columbus Zoo. And there was a gorilla and there was a large tractor tire. You know how big a tractor tire is. <laughs> and this gorilla would take this, he'd grab this tire and he'd pop it inside out. Wow. The strength that that takes is wow. beyond me. Wow. It's just, I can't. And he'd pop that tire in a tractor tire, which is stiff, hard, thick, wow. rubber, and pop it inside out. He was just playing. <laughs> he was just playing. So these human beings, many who were 12, 15 feet tall, there is in the, I think it's called the, it's in Afghanistan, they destroyed, remember the Buddhist statues that they blew up in Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Those were actually, they're different sizes. They go to real huge, big uh, 100 feet tall down to normal size human beings of today. But they were plastered over in, in by uh, successive civilizations and made into the form and shapes of Buddhas as Buddhism spread into that part of the world. But they were actually depictions of the beings who once existed that were giants. Uh, when you when you really study it and, and what happened, Galen's question was a was a really a good segue into this. Man was more ethereal than he was physical. And because he had not solidified in the astral and in the etheric worlds, uh, he was much larger. They said at densest concretion, which were, were actually, Blavatsky says, the world is beginning to dematerialize. We'll talk about that in just a minute. At the point of densest concretion, the human beings, their bodies that were hard, almost like stone. The, the skin was very, very, almost cement-like. And then as we are now in the uh, nada, we're in the nada of the fourth round. Uh, Blavatsky says the world is beginning to dematerialize. How could you prove such a thing? Because it would take initiate knowledge to understand that. If it was dematerializing, it would be almost impossible to prove because that means that everything is dematerializing. Right? Baker says that one of the ways that you can prove it is, is that every four years in the Olympics, world records are being broken. People are running faster. They're jumping higher, further. And as the world dematerializes, the the stress of gravity becomes less. And you have, but it's true in horse racing. It's true in dog racing. It's not just human beings. It's true in many aspects of our lives. Uh, it's worth thinking about. You want something to think about, think about that and question it. Read some of Blavatsky's books, in particular, volume two of uh, The Secret Doctrine, Anthropogenesis, and also Baker's book on anthropogeny, which is right there back mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. Tracy's head. And he explains it, Baker explains it perfectly and succinctly. Uh, Easiest the, way. <laughs> the what? He made it easy. Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah. He made it very easy to and, understand. Uh, and it explains the evolution from a, uh, in, in, from a mental globe, human beings too, uh, into an astral globe, into an etheric globe, into a concrete globe. In fact, 
you know, I had that. I had that chart. There it is. There it is. So it's showing, it's showing the structure of, of a mental globe, then the astral globe, the etheric globe, and we're right here. See that line, that pink line? That's where we're at. We're halfway through the life cycle, slightly halfway through the life cycle of the planet. And we're, we're moving on the true evolutionary arc. This is involution, and this is evolution. And so it's beginning to dematerialize. And uh, he explained it beautifully in one of his lectures that we just talked about. The, did you be able to get that on the, yeah. the earth chain? Yes. We're in the fourth, the fourth chain, what they call chain D. Uh, and that, that's where we're at, halfway through the life cycle of the Earth. And where does it go from there? Well, it goes into interchain nirvana. It goes into a period of rest at a very high level. <clears throat> so what we wanted to talk about was these early human beings. And Blavatsky says, Vasky says on page 381 of volume two, the secret doctrine called anthropogenesis, which is the birth and the evolution of human beings on the planet. That these cyclops, which the Greeks talked about, and, were, and all the intellectuals and the academics say well it's just it's mythology but their myth mythology was based in truth in fact there was a bizarre story and some of you may have heard about it or know about it recently that in afghanistan did anybody hear of, or read about the afghanistan giants no okay well i'm going to tell you what the story is the story is is that there was a uh, an army patrol that was out and they were in the mountains of Afghanistan. Probably the real origin of the, the true Aryan race. And they came upon a human being who they said was 13 feet tall. And of course, they he he attacked and killed one of the soldiers and then these guys with automatic weapons shot and killed the giant. And his body was shipped back to the United States from Afghanistan. They've hushed it all up, but there's been a controversy concerning this Afghan giant, which I don't care whether you believe it or not, doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that Blavatsky said, yeah, they existed. It's part of your DNA. Your DNA and your RNA. And your what your RNA is, is your RNA is the, similar to DNA, only it's related to the etheric body, to the etheric aspect of your sum total of your being, your RNA and your DNA. Your DNA is the physical composition of which your body is expressing itself. But it has the RNA left over from when you weren't, when human beings were not in a physical body. They were in these astral and etheric bodies. Still are. When you die, you go into the astral world, unless you're really lucky and you go straight to Devashan or some higher state, some people do. Very rare. But uh, 
these remnants still they periodically they mm -hmm. they surface because the memory is in the DNA uh, and RNA uh, uh, of every human being. Babies born with tails, right here. Uh, if you've ever wondered what a human with a tail would look, I've seen many pictures, many other than this one. I've seen many, many pictures of babies born with tails. And uh, they, what's interesting is they come from a certain part of the world mm -hmm. predominantly, but they're really all over the world. It's called a, a vestigial tail, a vestigial tail. And it means that it's a remnant from a past evolution. The what skin is, even looks kind of what? this color on the baby, you know? Doesn't the skin look darker and like it's a thicker skin? The baby's from another part of the world. Yeah. Okay. It's not an Anglo-Saxon baby. Oh. But the, saying the tail will fall off, there's no nerves or anything in there. Then. It falls off while the baby is forming. It yeah. starts with the tail, and then after about the eighth week, the tail falls off. This one kept its tail. I've seen them. I've seen, God, I don't know how many pictures of babies born with tails, and they have to cut them off, and sometimes they don't. And the kid will be 12 years old, and he'll have a tail. So that's what I'm saying. Sometimes you wouldn't be able to cut them off because there's something in there. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I have heard what that. What you're saying is as babies' head gets bigger, the tail falls off. The what? As the baby's head gets bigger, the tail falls off. As the baby itself gets bigger, in the moment, it's in the embryonic state, the I tail falls off while the embryo is forming. It starts out with it. Yeah, I've heard at the hospital, when the baby's born with a tail, they just cut it off. Yeah. 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 Babies who are born with one eye are killed. What? Yeah. Yeah, they destroy them. I talked to Baker about it years ago. Yeah. It's just a, it's one, it's one of the best kept secrets of medical science. You know, just the, kill the baby. There was a song about this. That. This man was born in Indonesia, mm -hmm. probably in the countryside in Indonesia. Huh. They had a song about a one eyed, it was a one eyed, one horned, blind, purple people leader. <laughs> <laughs> <That's what they laughs> but I got the idea from you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, if you read uh, volume two, uh, there are references uh, about probably six different references in volume two where Blavatsky talks about the Cyclops people, the Cyclops race. And again, she says all of the most gigantic structures uh, on the planet were built by that race of people because they were so huge, uh, so gigantic. They found a, a grave uh, it was in Greece mm -hmm. of, there was, of, a, uh, of a human being that was something like 30 feet tall. Well, there was, and the Bible talks about it. Yes, absolutely. You know, the Bible yeah. talks about the race of giants. And in the Odyssey, what? the Odyssey, they had yeah. the Cyclops in there right. from Greece. Right. They've yeah. unearthed like in the tombs, like in Egypt and stuff, oh. um, uh, pictures, glyphs of um, the very tall people, mm -hmm. and then the little ones yeah. around the, yeah. in the Sumerian text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even in the the, the graphics uh, of the Egyptian temples, they show immense beings, mm -hmm. and then the yeah. little tiny human yeah. beings and that's the way they move the, the the way i'll tell you one of the secrets of, since you brought it up um, it's it's initiate knowledge bailey talked about it but didn't define it and they said well alice how were the pyramids built and she said well they were built from the top down so one of the really smart guys who follows bailey said oh well that means that they they were in etheric form, which they were the ideal concept. It's always in a mental form or an etheric form. And then it will it eventually it concretizes itself through human effort on a physical plane, and they build it. 
But what happened with the pyramids, I don't know if I've ever told you this before or not, is that where the pyramids are built on the plateau, there were hills, enormous hills of stone, and they simply cut the stone and slid them down into place. There are 17 additional pyramids that are buried underground, under the sands, uh, beyond the pyramids. They've detected them. 17. None of them have been dug up that I know of. And probably the reason that they haven't been dug up is that a guy by the name of Zahi Awas, who is in charge of Egyptian antiquities, uh, won't allow him to be dug up because it would blow his whole cover. See, he says the Egyptians built them and the Egyptians didn't build them. The Atlanteans built them. And they're not 5,000 or 6,000 years old. They're 80,000, as Blavatsky said. Bailey said they were older than that. She said they were 200 and some thousand years old. Hmm. And they may be. It may be that the truncated, the very first pyramids that were truncated were 200 and some thousand years old. And then they were completed 80,000 years ago to the height of the capstone. It's worth thinking. But they were originally designed to be astronomical observatories, and that will be discovered uh, in the future. They'll be able to photograph down, as I've told you before, through the stone, and they'll find at, at the height of 50 stones, they'll find the original truncated pyramid. And there are carvings in the stone of the astrological glyphs and the planets. And uh, I've told you about my experience of traveling back in the Akashic record and uh, what is called the, uh, the Grand Gallery was actually a porthole for a, a, a telescope that the Egyptians had built. And as I was standing at the base floor of the Grand Gallery, I could look out through the Grand Gallery. It was daylight. It was like high noon. And I could see through the blue sunlit atmosphere, I could see into the dark of night, into outer space. And I knew that there was uh, this telescope that they had. They could slide the lenses back and forth depending upon what planet they wanted to look at, they could adjust it and it would reflect itself in a pool of mercury. And they would make their observations in that. What time is it? We've run past mm -hmm. our time. Okay, so we'll have to say good night and goodbye to our Zoom friends. How many tuned in tonight? Just two? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a little discouraging, but we'll pick up. Anybody have any questions on uh, a Zoom tonight? Just unmute yourself if you do and ask. Okay, I guess not. So that's it. Uh, we can reconvene. They say thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, David. We can reconvene.